Tom, welcome to Ocean 18. You are the very first ocean that I cross. Thank you. And welcome to Las Vegas, to London International Awards. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, so what's going to happen today is uh, I'm going to get into your mind and rob everything I can, <laughs> personal mm -hmm. stories. That's why it's called like the Ocean Series, like, you know, uh, in honor of like Steven Soderbergh, but also like, you know, to, uh, to be inspired by the story that you can share. So seven questions, like the seven C's, and I will start with the first one. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, so in 2008, uh, the New York Times revealed that emerging author J. T. Leroy was actually a persona created by 40-year-old Laura Albert. Leroy books became bestseller, the crossover pop culture. It became a phenomenon. And uh, he became also a phenomenon in Hollywood. I remember during that time, uh, JT Leroy started appearing everywhere, red carpet, and it was like this very agey um, boy with like long blonde hair and like big black sunglasses, very agey. And of course, his books were phenomenal. The way the style was so unique. One of the books, it was called The Heart is the Seafall Above All Things and became an iconic book, mostly in Europe. Has your heart ever deceived you in your career? And have you find yourself in a role that, that didn't really fit you, like J.T. Leroy? Well, well, I think I've deceived myself many times through, throughout my <laughs> professional life. I, I mean, I, I, it's how it goes, I guess. Right. I, um, I was working in bars for many years. I matured very late. And so the reason I'm in this industry, because I was, I was working at this bar in Stockholm, and all the people there were advertising people, or right. most of them. And they, you know, they were beautiful, and they were funny, and they had great clothes, and, you know, and they could afford to buy drinks and eat at restaurants. And I... I just wanted to be on the other side of the bar. <laughs> so, so the reason why I started was I, I wanted to be, I wanted to have money. I didn't have any money. I wanted, I wanted money. That's, that's the mm -hmm. true story. But over time, in professional life and in private life, you have different uh, ambitions and driving mm -hmm. forces. You know, a lot of people at some point, they want to prove themselves to their parents for instance, or they want to prove themselves to, to their enemies, or they want to prove themselves to themselves, or, or they want to make money, or they want to... There's so many different ways that can be behind your motivation, and it changes over time. And I think there is always situations where you're not necessarily sure of why you're doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. and you make up reasons for yourself. Looking back, you know, you can usually tell it's like, oh, well, this maybe it was really about this or that. But I think I deceived myself many times in kind of coming up with reasons why, why I'm still in the game or why I'm doing what I'm doing. How old were you when you were working at the bar? I was working in bars up until I was 25. So, so it's considered today kind of a late start. But I started in advertising at the age of 26 because... Mm -hmm. I, I studied graduate in journalism, and then like I, 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 I traveled to London and like you know I stayed there for like a few years, and and then I start finally like you know advertising. So also was a late, a late start. But I think it's good that because I think you got to put some living into it. I had failed at so many things before I started, right. so I was I was already a bit humbled. <laughs> okay. Second question, look, before cell phone and social media, creative collaborations were built on physical presence. There is a creative collaboration that struck with me and it was between two giants in the creative field. Uh, a wonderful man that unfortunately passed away 
uh, River Phoenix, a wonderful actor, the, the older brother of Joaquin Phoenix, and Flea from the Royal Chili Pepper. They, the two met uh, during like uh, a movie uh, shot by Gu Van San called My Own Private Idol mm -hmm. with Kanye Reeves. During the movie, like Flair and uh, River, they start collaborating together. Uh, outside the movie, they, they, they nurtured this uh, uh, very like precious friendship and they became over the years very close and they share a lot of like, you know, creative power. Um, has it ever happened to you that you are you were exposed to another person, maybe in another different parts of the world, and you engaged and built a true creative relationship where like you were sharing ideas and uh, we are collaborating. Uh, it could be even like outside the advertising industry. Yes, it has happened to me. I, um, I was working in, in New York for, for, for many years and uh, the person running creative uh, for us on the West Coast was a colleague, her name was Andrew Lamiers. Mm. And she was always punching above her weight. And even, that sh even when she was junior, like she was usually the most senior people in the room in the way that she related to clients, to the assignment, to herself, to her colleagues, to, to everything, to the work. And so we started working more and more and partnering more on work. And so we ended up I think we worked every single day, you know, for five years up until she died, um, like a year ago. Like she was, uh, she was judging the, the Andes. Oh, I, I hear about the story. We talked about it last year here in, uh, at London International Awards. I remember. Yeah. So I learned so many things from her. Um, mostly about leadership like she was leadership is hard right like it's you it's uh, something you build over time and you need to figure out that, like what's your leadership style and you can lead by example or you can lead by creating a culture you can lead by creating a process um, and her leadership style of just camaraderie and um, and uh, friendship um, was um, was something I've never seen before. So um, it um, she she made me grow a lot. Oh, what a wonderful story! What a small word. You know that story uh, of this woman that unfortunate, like this tragic event. Like, who stayed stay with me? I, I, like, you know, didn't know her, never met her. But from time to time, I think about this story and. This is like so serendipitous, but I was thinking about this while I was flying from San Diego to Las Vegas just today. Hmm. Wow. Uh, going to the awards. And now I'm, I met you and like you were so close to her. This is like incredibly. Okay. So the lowest point on earth is six miles under the ocean. And the highest tip the highest point on Earth is the tip of K1 in Nepal. Now, the distance between the lowest point and the highest point is only 11 miles. If you were capable of grabbing Manhattan, the island of Manhattan, which is like 11 miles, that's the distance between the lowest and the highest point on Earth. That changed your perspective a lot when you start like putting numbers on certain kind of things in, in life. Do you think that your perspective in PR as an industry has changed and the highest and the lowest has gotten closer or has gotten farther apart of the years? Um, I, I mean, my perspective has certainly changed. I think the whole industry's perspective has changed. Um, I, um, PR wasn't my first choice. What I, was your first choice? 
like I said, I was working in a bar. I wanted to be in advertising. I wanted to be, I wanted to make money. <laughs> <laughs> well, PR uh, is still advertising. Yeah, yeah, though. well, um, but um, it was, earned, earned media was the buzzword in right. Cannes around 2009, 2010, when they started the PR right. category. At the point, that point, earned pretty much meant that you would PR the advertising. Mm -hmm. That was what you know most CMOs and most people in the industry would consider was earned. Now it's actually the opposite. You know, earned now is you advertise the PR. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So it's first you do something. I I usually ask my teams and my clients like, are we designing an idea for the jungle, or for the zoo? <laughs> right. I like that. And the jungle obviously is the real world, and if you design an idea for the jungle, it can survive out there in the real world, go head to head with everything's out there, right? Or you can design an idea for the zoo, which is that kind of safe, made up branded world where, you know, the animals get fed right. every day through paid support, or whatever it needs to survive. But in the end, most people don't care about them. Right? Also, what I found out is, um, as a creative, one of the things that uh, I've always uh, ask a request there's like whenever there is a new brief a new assignment uh, ideally I would like to have every single department around the table uh, at the moment of the brief and so I always ask uh, to have like media if there is the possibility to have media in house and the PR and uh, I remember up until like very very recently whenever I ask like can be can PR be at the table when uh, the client brief us or whenever like we're gonna brief creative, I was always look upon in a weird way, right? So somehow you, somehow like uh, creative wouldn't enter like neither the jungle nor the zoo. <laughs> it would be <laughs> right. like very late in the process. But I think that uh, maybe in the past couple of years, things have changed. I've noticed that a uh, few agents have adopted like uh, a different approach with PR and it's paying off right now. But I think like if you use it in the right ways, it's an amazing tool in the, in the creative field. Um, but I love the analogy of like the zoo and the jungle. I, I found like fascinating that analogy. It's good. It works. But you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough to work many years with Rob Riley. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, when, when he was at McCann World Group, I've, I've been in the creative leadership team there for many years. And then he brought the whole kind of Crispin Porter, yeah, yeah. write the press release thing. So, I mean, the thinking was, I mean, the thinking is not new, but you know, in full candor, it's probably one of the more difficult p talent to find in our industry is, is good earned creatives. Yeah. There are very few of them still. I can't really understand why, but it's still the case. Love the jungle, by the way, man. Jungle Zoo. You know, it's like Arthur Miller in the... Um, there is a beautiful quote from uh, a death of a salesman, um, Willie Loman, which is like, you know, the, the protagonist in the Arthur Miller play, uh, the brother, an older brother that went to Africa and he made a lot of money. And there is these quotes that uh, this brother appeared to Willie Loman throughout the play, almost in a dreamlike scenario. And he say, when I was 21, I walk in the jungle and I came out richer than ever. And I always thought that was like an amazing, like, you know, set of words, like very like <laughs> interesting. Anyway, uh, four question. Poet and novelist, Ocean Vuong, born in Vietnam, captured the fleeting beauty of life in his work. It's a collection of poems called On Earth, We Are Briefly Gorgeous. If you could preserve one thing from the passage of time that defines the beauty of living, what would that be? In my professional life or in my private life? Or is it throughout history of mankind? I would like in your private life, if you could preserve one thing. Preserve one thing in my private life. 
Um, Let me help you here. Okay. Um, one of my favorite poem. Um, it's a uh, Robert Frost poem. I actually have a tattoo here on my forearm, and it's titled "Nothing Gold Can Stay." And it's a poem that is recited in the movie Outsider, uh, shot by Francis Ford Coppola, but uh, based on the mo- on the on the book of Louise uh, Hilton. Um, and it's true because, like you know, when you think about either our professional career or like you know our entire existence, there is a time, a very very short time, where things are golden, where like you are reaching a peak, when you're briefly gorgeous. But that time is very short. If there is that particular moment in your life, what moment is and how much would you stretch it? I mean, I, I remember when I grew up and that was when I was 29, we had our twins. Oh, wow. And I, I grew up very fast. I was, I was a stay-at-home dad for, for two years. And after that, you're not afraid of work anymore because you know what real work is. And, <laughs> and, and going, going to work is just vacation. So that was, it was magical in a way that, you know, how you're forced to kind of be a grown up or yeah. how you're forced to be all that you can be in a, in a way. Right. So, so that was, I mean, that was something that I didn't see happen, but was very important for me. And it went by fast. It went by fast. But then another thing that I started dancing late in life. Dancing? Dancing, yeah. Well, now now yeah. you have to like digress. Yeah, yeah. And, and that to me is, is probably, you know, it's, it's, that's magical. What kind of dance? So I have a friend that's into the house music scene. Okay. And uh, he started going again, like, look at me, I'm, you know, I'm 50. But there's, there's a scene still alive for people of all ages and, you know, of all kinds. And um, it was a beautiful thing to rediscover that community um, that made me see, you know, the beauty in, in myself and in other people. That's beautiful. So that, the moment of dancing, something that you took it and now you're stretching it. <laughs> That's yeah. that's beautiful, man. I love that. And house music, house music is actually, uh, it's big, it's huge, like in uh, in Sweden, right? Because I, I I remember also there is a festival in Berlin, the house music festival that happen every year. Am I correct? So there's so many festivals in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There okay, um, Jean Beret was the first woman to circumnavigate the globe in 1774. Uh, but she had to disguise herself as a man to join a French naval expedition because she wasn't allowed to join this expedition as a woman. I mean, we're talking about like, you know, hundreds of years ago, but still, if you could meet her today, this woman that no matter no matter like the, the resistance that she had found, she was capable of like circumnavigating the globe. If you could meet her today, what would be the first thing that you ask her? The first thing, uh, maybe I'll ask her how to cope with a world that's fucked up. <laughs> Like the world that she lived in, right? (laughs) Yeah. Like how do you, if you have your ideas of who you are, what you want to do, like your ambitions and everything you want to accomplish or everything you want to see in the world that won't allow it or won't Mm. won't recognize it, how do you cope with that? How do you make peace with a world like that? How do you, Mm. and I mean, it's still true for, for so many people, right, across the world. Like how do you make peace with with um with uh everything that is broken broken in the way that it's mm. it's broken only for you right how do you make peace how i make peace mm-hmm. if you can make peace i mean 
the world is not broken, so it's broken for me the way it was broken for her and broken right. for a lot of people. So, but how I make, how do I make peace with the the things that you go through in life? It's a very, it's a very personal question. Um, do you feel that throughout the years you built like a good enough armor? to go through life, even to go through your career, even to work like in, in, in like, you know, in, in this industry, it can be tough, it can be challenging. Like, you know, uh, uh, the American market is like cruel, it's like unforgiving, it like, is. you know, yeah, yeah. Um, just recently, I was on LinkedIn last week and I, and I saw this update from a woman announcing that she was let go uh, by a company that I don't want to mention the name, but it's a very well-known company, while she was on maternity leave. I mean, that's inhumane, right? Like, you know, there is no explanation. There is no justification. And I couldn't make sense of that. I, I had read that post uh, three, four times, and the woman was, wasn't be there was actually grateful for like her team about, I couldn't make sense of those words. How can someone mm -hmm. has to go through that during like probably the most joyful moment as a, like giving birth to a new, to, to a new baby and, and, and at the same time, losing the financial security and losing a job and being like, let go. That's like, yeah, yeah. you no, don't make tough. sense of the stuff. That's I, fucked up. Um, I mean, that was, that's the perk of, of like being junior in a market like the Swedish market. Because it's basically against the law to fire someone, right? Yeah, but it's not in America. <laughs> no, not like America is very tough. But yeah. like I, to me, it's so obvious that it goes hand in hand with creativity and, and you know, people being allowed to express themselves is feeling safe. Yeah. And I... I mean, I've, I've done so many mistakes and I've done so many worthless piece of work. I've given so many bad advice. And the reason I still had a job was because, you know, you, you are given two, three, four, five, six chances. And so I, you grow, right? And people are, you know, in a good environment, people will tell you, it's like, Tom, that was not good. Like, you messed up. But you're still not damaged goods, right? right. So um, yeah, I agree. It's it's a it's a it's a terrible situation when you don't feel safe. Yeah. At you know at, at the place of work. Well, six question. Jerry Seinfeld once said that it's important to leave something in the tank, so you are propelled into your next venture. If you don't do that, and you completely like exhaust whatever you have in the tank. You have nothing left to start your next venture. What signal that it's time for you? What's the thing that you understand, okay, it's time for me now to go into the next venture. And do you have the same approach of Jerry Seinfeld? Do you try always to leave something in the tank so you can start your next adventure? Or you completely drain yourself and you had to take a break and eventually start your next adventure a few months or maybe even a year after um i mean i've i've, I've done i've done a, a few parallel adventures you mm -hmm. know uh, not very successful um and i think it's important like i i understand what he means i think but it's also important to have some parallel paths but it changes you know, life humbles you, mm. right? And I think when Angela died, um, it's changed me too. Like you talked about building an armor. Maybe you spend, you know, the first half of your life with building that armor to protect yourself, right? And then you spend the second half dismantling that armor because that's gonna, in the end, protect yourself. Like to really be free or feel that you are you are who you are mm -hmm. and uh after she died for me it's not about saving you know some gas in the tank it's more of dismantling 
you know the 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 armor and then just be um it sounds cringy perhaps but just uh uh i don't worry anymore i don't worry i don't worry about the next adventure professional life can be very rewarding and it can give you a sense of identity but usually you know it provides you know for yourself and your family and put foods on food on the table but it's just the job and so for me I, i'm not i i don't have to leave anything in the tank for my next professional adventure i there's always gonna if i want to do something i'll do it but you i it's more important perhaps to leave something in the tank for your for your real life for your private life for the people that really cares about you that's a beautiful answer tom i love the um I was talking to a friend of mine, and I think we're talking about this topic, exactly this. And um, we're talking how, like, you know, truly you, you built, like, there is, there is, like, a, you climb a mountain, and then there is a moment in time in your life, um, halfway through, where you descend on the other side of the mountain, and sometimes you leave the opposite of what's, you were living the first half. You say like, you know, you spend your first uh, 50 years like building an armor and then like the rest of your life dismantle this armor. And you say something that's, I don't care anymore. Like, you know, I don't worry anymore, sorry. I don't worry anymore. Uh, which is also like something that happened like, you know, uh, later in life, like when I was and it happened to me as well. Like, you know, I also on a, on a level of caring, a, a care in a different way when it comes to the job. Um, the perspective change and like, you know, perspective is very physical to me. Um, I always imagine like, you know, perspective always come with a stance. Like, you know, you really stand uh, with your feet on the ground. And I think that there is a moment in time where you, your feet pivot and you change stance, you change perspective. And with that, everything also uh, change and, uh, and, and you start feeling different emotions. And like, you know, but it only comes like in a certain time of your life. Um, unexpectedly like that's what i found out at least for me yeah okay so last question as the president of the pr jury london international well, this is your first time as a jury president at the lia at the lia yeah okay you are here to evaluate some of the most creative world in the world now the london international awards have established themselves as a permanent mark in the creative industry now when you look at like most of the awards, the big award show, for, there is one thing about the LIA, and uh, of course I'm biased, but like you know, there is one thing about this organization is like truly made for creative, by creative. Like you know, there is no client <laughs> uh, here, and um, so my question is like, if you were tasked with crafting a PR headline for to capture the essence of the london international awards what would the headline say what would be the headline i mean you're right i i agree it's i mean i i spent this morning first like having you know a conversation with terry savage and then with barbara and like you end up you know it starts with like you're talking business or you're talking mm -hmm. you know the the work that's about to be done but soon enough, you're talking about death and like, you know, it's, it's just weird. It's very personal here. You get very close. I, yes, I've, I've, I've judged most shows. This is different because it's a much more personal experience and you're like in this room, you're in Vegas, you're at this weird place. There's, you know, a lot of great people here come here and, and uh, it's an opportunity to, to change your mind. I think that's, that is the job for anyone being on any jury is that you want to walk away with a new perspective on the work. So the headline would say, this isn't just business, this is personal. 
That's a great headline. Right thank there. you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Look, it was like very interesting to cross your ocean and to get into your mind. And uh, I wish you like a great stay. Like, uh, when are you flying back to Sweden? Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning. So you have a few days. Because... A few days. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you for having me.